Hi to you all out there in Zoom land. My name is Peter Waples Crow, and I'm an Aboriginal, I'm the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Project Officer here at Thorn Harbour Health. Naya Narigu, I'm Narigu, which is from the high country of New South Wales, um, in the southeastern part, and people will know it as the Snowy Mountains. Um, and I work part time at Thorn Harbour Health, and I've worked here for nearly three years and live in Melbourne for over 16. I'm a visitor here on Cool and Country, which has been very kind to me. My pronouns are he, him, and I don't mind they, them either, and identify as Q for queer in the rainbow. As you can see, I've had um, some amazing guests with me, Jacob Bowen, um, Naomi Aisling and, Asling and Stone Motherless Cold, so, who are joining me for this special panel called First Nations and Queer, a yarning panel. And I really want to thank them for the time today. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that I am on the meeting on the, um, that I'm coming to you from the lands of the mighty Bulgarong people. And I will pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that out to all the ancestors of the countries you find yourself on today. And as part of, uh, as part of this meeting and to all First Nation people um, who are here with us. Today I will be hosting this session that prioritises First Nation and queer voices and the things that matter to us. I'm really mindful that the backdrop of this discussion is the new coronavirus shutdown here in Melbourne um, and the, the recent Black Lives Matter movement. It's been a pretty intense time. Um, before I start with any questions, I might get the fabulous panel to introduce themselves. You can tell us as much or as little as you like. Um, and how you've been doing recently, or some fun fact. Let's start with Jacob. Hey everyone, um, my name is Jacob Bowen. I'm a Narunga and Ghana man. Um, we come from the Adelaide Plains and York Peninsula of South Australia, but I've been born and raised here in Melbourne. Um, I come to you from Wurundjeri country in the city of Melbourne. My pronouns are he, him, and I identify as gay on the spectrum of queerness. Hi. And how have you been doing for Jacob in recent times? How have I been doing? I've actually yeah. been okay. I think this second round of lockdown, I've noticed that my, I've just been aware that this time my, my psychology is a little bit more delicate than the first round. Going into a second round, it feels a little bit on knife's edge. So I'm just aware to be kinder to myself and everyone around me, actually. Mm. Yeah, good. I'm sort of feeling the same way. So mm. it's good to hear. Um, now I'm going to introduce Naomi. Um, how are you today, Naomi? And you Hi, are thanks, Peter. I'm good. Um, I'm coming in from Wadawurrung country, down in Geelong. Um, I'm a Gayiri woman from... Central Highlands, Queensland, so around Emerald, um, Springshaw. Um, I'm in Geelong at the moment, working from home, has been for five months, um, and enjoying working from home, I think, only because I have the mixture of being in the sun, not in the office, um, and really looking forward to today's um, session and chat um, and feel very blessed to be um, asked to be a part of this. Oh, that's Naomi. That's really sweet. Um, and now I'm handing over to Stone Motherless Cold. Stone, do you want to introduce yourself and um, tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, I'm Stone Motherless Cold. My pronouns are they, them. I'm currently on Andre Bonorong Country. Um, and I'm excited for this conversation. And I've been, I just moved into a new place. So I guess I'm good. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Where have you moved to? I uh, moved to Brunswick. Oh, nice. Yes, but on the other side of Sydney Road. So apparently the border of Sydney Road is gonna keep me away from the hotspot, apparently. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Stone. I'm so glad you could be here and I feel, look, I I send that out to all of you. It's really amazing to have you here. Um, I'm just going to ask a series of questions as a starting point. 
And these questions were posed originally by Jacob and Nisha in the counselling team here at Thorn Harbour. I thought they were a good starting point. Um, and I guess just give it a little shout out to them, acknowledge that that's, that, yeah, they, they come from them. Who would like to start first? And the first question is, what has been your experience as a First Nations queer person? Is there a story that comes to mind? An image, a song, a quote, anything like that? Um, Stone, do you want to go first? Um, I'm going to have to think about that one for a sec. Okay. Yeah. Amy? I have an interesting story, actually. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, so having uh, living in Central Australia for quite a while, and I was working with senior law elders for quite a few years and being very open and honest around who I was and um, my relationships and had a um, quite an intimate conversation around one of my senior leaders at the time and it was made reference to the fact that my relationship wasn't um, was wrong way and so there was a, a different language as well used so the the senior elder her lang English was her fourth language um, and described that my relationship at the time with another woman was wrong way so when I asked because I've always been a curious person and wanted to ask and sort of understand where she was coming from she said it come from the Bible um, and God said that women and men have to be in a relationship rather than same sex and I said to her um, especially as a woman of really strong culture I said when we look at our um, ancestors and where we come from which is the star people those star people were androgynous they were non-gendered and she pondered that for a little while and I allowed for just to sit with her. And then from that, it come that it was acceptable because it wasn't about gender. It was actually about love. So I guess that sort of opened up a whole new um, acceptance for me having interactions with other senior elders who were not accepting but may not have been sort of making the connections prior to colonization and and the influence of christianity so um that was that was the story when i um that first come to mind it was like you know culture history love um how we identify or whether we do identify, but it was it was like a turning point for me. And I think that brought in um, my cultural, traditional cultural experience, um, my identity, and also brought them very strongly connected on a foundation of love and acceptance. So um, it was it was beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. It's great. You're part of, yeah, it's a really great story. Yeah, similar to that, I am um, similar to Naomi. Uh, I suppose I've been lucky in, in the fact that it's my father's family that is Aboriginal. So, and over on the Narunga Ghana side of my family, like we have family members that are all parts of the rainbow the LGBTIQ plus rainbow. So me coming out as a gay man wasn't a really big thing um, within the family. But the story that came to my mind about being uh, of an experience of being, you know, queer and, and First Nations was similar to Naomi's in that when I was, my formal training is in dance. I went to NASDA College of Dance, which is Australia's longest running Aboriginal Islander dance college and part of that training is we got training in the western canon of dance but the foundations that we learned was to do cultural and traditional dance and we learned from song men and song women uh, law men and law women from all over the country 
And we ourselves, as students, we came from all over the country in Sydney. It was a bloody amazing time. Um, and the first trip that we ever did, the first ceremony that I ever learned as a, as a NASDA dance student was uh, from the Tiwi Islands. And it was a creation ceremony of, um, of Purukupali. Uh, yeah, creation, creation ceremony. And part of that lesson, we had the elders that would come down and teach us in Sydney. And then we all went up to the Tiwi Islands to do a residency up there. Part of that was we would dance their ceremony for them, which as you can imagine is nerve wracking. But all us little young, all us little young um, baby, baby gays all hopped on the plane and went up there thinking we were going to freak, we were all freaking out a bit about, you know, being queer and going up into traditional community. Mm. But then we got off the plane and we were greeted by the sister girls, the Tiwi, sister, Tiwi Island sister girls. And everyone was like, what? <laughs> what? And I suppose not only for myself, but for a lot of us, that was a big lesson um, for all of us and a real, uh, an introduction into how our queerness and our culture could coexist and how our responsibilities to culture was essentially part of us regardless of who we slept with. Mm -hmm. mm. Great, thanks Jacob. Um, yeah, it's really important. Um, Stone, do you have like, what comes to um, mind, image of some or? What comes to mind is, I guess, when I first, when I first moved down to so-called Melbourne and that was just, um, and I came to Melbourne Uni and then I was like surrounded by heaps of Indigenous people, um, which had like more than I had ever been like, grow, like going to schools and stuff being one of the five like black fellas in school. So, um, but then also hanging out with a lot of like the queer mob and then just like hearing all their stories and then them applying their queer lens to their stories and their histories and stuff and them kind of figuring it out. And then it like made me open, like, yeah, just being in Melbourne and having a community of queer mob um, around to kind of be like, yeah, we've been around. And then they kind of be like, this, 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 and this, 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 and we have this in language and we have this role and this, and I'm like, oh, wow. So I guess just being in a place like so-called Melbourne where there's a lot of queer mob and just hearing their own queer, queer lens applied to their stories is what I think of, like you've just done beforehand. Yeah, great. Thanks, Um It sort of leads on to it. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we can ask this, but someone can have a go. Um, What's your experience as a First Nations person taught you about queerness? And then what's your queerness taught you about being First Nations? Can I guess we were talking about that stuff as well. So. Um, I would say that it, it, it's taught me that it's like in, it's linked, inextricably linked. Um, and so like if somebody, if somebody is being like, transphobic or if somebody's being racist then it's kind of the same thing like if somebody is like um like sister girls don't exist or it's not a valid gender then you're also being racist and you're also being transphobic because it's tied together and we have to like remove this colonial lens that we have that and so and like so many mob think that queerness was brought by colonial mm. um mm by colonialism and then it's just, and then also there's that weird thing of like Christianity, like Christianity was also brought, but they also think that queerness was brought. I know it's all, it's all linked. They all teach, they all teach me, teach me the same thing because it's all linked together. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, what, what you're bringing up and also what Naomi had touched on before about the effects of Christianity and um, mm. religion in our communities um, does play a huge part on, yeah, on some people's experiences. Like I was lucky, I, I've kind of been brought up in a very liberal um, family, 
But, you know, I did a tour once. Um, I was working with Polyglot Puppet Theatre as a puppeteer and a dancer, and we did a national tour. I remember we stopped off in Mount Isa, and it was the, what's that thing they have in Queensland where you're either a maroon or you're a blue? What's that oh, called? Oh, right. Yeah, origin. Yeah, origin. that was on. That was on. <laughs> and that was the, um, we it's went culture. to the local pub. Eh? It's a different sort of culture. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's amazing because, like, the one thing that I noticed when we were, when we landed in Mount Isa, it was like, okay, the blacks walked on this side of the street and the whites walked on that side of the street. But in state of origin, you were either a blue or a maroon and it was divided on the side of the pub, mixed. And then all of a sudden, the, you know, like it was the only gay in the village turned up to our table and he started talking to me, but the poor thing had been, had been bruised like he'd been beaten by mob for being queer. Mm. And I'm like, okay, so what's this about? And then, you know, and he went to tell me that, you know, religion and Christianity was, was rife um, in that community. And I think that, like what Naomi was talking about, has much to do with people's experience of how they live with their queerness and their culture. Mm. I agree. We can't get away from that history, and that's the history that we, um, uh, you know, the erasure of us under Christianity, and mm. yeah. So I think a lot of people talk about, it, and some of the academics as well, you know, about that erasure of our lives under that gaze and that lens um, and colonial lenses. Um, but I always say, you know, we're here, and we're really a vibrant part of the culture, and um, yeah. Particularly now in the arts, like I'm wow, yeah. noticed as you probably would have, um, as you all would have, like there's this, there's this surge of, of queer First Nations arts that mm. is currently doing the rounds of venues and festivals. It's really, really quite an exciting time. Mm. Um, thanks for all that. Why don't I move on to Naomi and talking about... Um, I guess a lot of people want to know where I work and we're talking about culturally relevant services and queer friendly services. So have you had a positive experience receiving a service, Naomi, and any service, you might want to reflect on anything mm -hmm. where you felt really respected. Um, if you were to imagine a service where you felt most welcome and able to sit entirely in your queerness and as a First Nation person, what sort of qualities come to mind? That's a question for everyone, but just to think about what messages people need to make us, yeah, to include us in the mix as well. Yeah. I guess the first part of that question is my experience. So um, being married to a woman for 10 years and, you know, both having admissions over the time to um, hospitals, and mainstream Western medicine models of health. Um, and we're both quite nurturing in terms of our well-being when we're in that environment. We are very much um, hands-on, you know, like nurturing when we're in when each of us are in hospital. And I think at one point, one point, um, one of us was in hospital. I couldn't, I can't remember which hospital. And one of us was in in the bed, and it was a very um, distressing time. So the other one got in, and we were both on this hospital bed comforting each other and the nurses come in and it was like oh would you like a moment I have to do this would you like me to come back and it was like how respectful there was like there was no negative reaction we didn't feel any sort of um, uncomfortableness from the staff member it was just the fact that you know it was a stressful time one of us was very sick we were comforting, we're very nurturing and hand, like hands on holding hands and, you know, sort of brushing each other's head. And there was no, you know, that sort of service, I think in such a huge mainstream um, environment was actually, that was, 
that was actually probably one of the best experiences that I can come, think of coming to mind when we're both, one, we're very vulnerable. Um, two, we were able to comfort each other as the way we do in a stressful situation. And there was no judgment. Um, that person gave us that space and respected that, you know, one of us was having a hard time at the moment. So I think some of the qualities reflecting on that, and there was a couple of other situations, was having an environment where people are really well educated. Um, I think values of human rights and compassion. So knowing that compassion is across the board, such as love. It's not gendered, it's not discriminated. Um, and I think it's about understanding being human, what, what we need when we're really vulnerable and not having expectations around what that looks like. Yeah. Does anyone want to echo add to that or talk yeah. about that? So I mean, maybe. Yeah. There was one, um, one experience came to mind. So in 1998, I was diagnosed with HIV. And from the, the, the first couple of doctors that I'd seen, I was then referred to ACON, because I was in Sydney, I was still, I was still dancing um, at NASDA. And I was referred to ACON because ACON at the time had an Aboriginal team that would take um, blackfellas who'd been recently diagnosed. And it was one of the, I mean, it was a godsend for me. It was actually, it saved me because the, it was only a small team. It was a trans woman um, and, a, and a gay man, gay cis man, whose brother was HIV and who just, his brother had just had a um, fathered a child and his partner was, you know, their, his partner and the child were both negative. So he had had um, experience through his brother and, and just having the both of them to be able to, to be able to field questions that I had around my diagnosis at the time, but particularly through a cultural lens and try and, and, and make sense of what this might mean for myself as an Aboriginal man, as an Aboriginal gay man. I mean, it was just so necessary that that service existed for me. Mm. Um, and it kind of, you know, it was wonderful. It was wonderful that I could go to something like that. I don't know that there are those services necessarily that are out there and existing at the moment, which is really a shame, particularly because we're, we're seeing a spike in HIV diagnosis. Yeah. And not just, and as gay cis men, we're the, they're, we're the lowest ones on the ladder. It's the cis women and cis men through heterosexual sex and IV drug use that are, the rising, um, you know, the, like, that's where the, where the rise is. So yeah. having those kind of services for our mob, those, those culturally specific services for our mob, I think. I think they're still there, Jacob. I think the, but, um, I think the services are like from there. And, but a lot of them, it really there was a lot more services. And that's what yeah. I mean. There was a lot more services yeah. back in the day when I was diagnosed. There was it a lot of lost services. a lot of stuff, you know. So yeah, yeah. And, and thanks for being so sort of up and open, you know, about your HIV, living with HIV, because you know it's really important to have that voice as well, you know. And I know you, you are a, a really strong advocate in the community, and I really appreciate you for that. So thank oh, you. that's all good. Yeah. Stone. Um, it doesn't have to be a health service. It could be another service. It, we, or you could just add to anything. What What would make a fantastic service? You know. Um, yeah, I guess just the same thing. Just like a culturally safe space, but also a culture. Like I know. I think before I knew that there were like when I first came to Melbourne and was going to Vacho and then I was like, I definitely go to, if I was going for something like queer health related, I wouldn't go to Vacho. And then if it was just like my general health, then I um, would. So I guess like, sorry. Why was that? Why is that? 
What? Um, I think that like if I was going for like a test, if I was going for like an SCI test or something, um, I guess just feeling a bit shame going mm -hmm. there at first. But um, I guess that's something that I had to like sit with myself and be like, why do I not feel like I can go there for queer things and why do I separate it when I should just be able to go by like it to one place because it's all a service that should be for me. Um, yeah. I guess reflecting on that, um, I use, you know, the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service as my key service because mm -hmm. I like the cultural connection there, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I haven't really, um, yeah, I found it really good, you know, and it, it nurtures me culturally, which is important. Um, but I've also used queer services like, you know, and um, mainstream services. So I'm a real advocate that we have to have options as well. Mm. So, you know, it, when people don't want to access different services that we need more options as queer Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders as well, you know, and um, we don't really have a queer health service, uh, Aboriginal service, even nationally, you know, and I, I've noticed that we don't get together a lot as mob um, that much as well. So. Yeah, we've got a bit of a way to go. I guess... Well, talking about national services, I yeah. also think of, like, Black like Rainbow. Yeah. Um, like, I, I look at their website and I'm a bit confused to, like, are they a consultancy or are they... Um, uh, yeah, I don't... Like, it doesn't... I don't know what I can use it for. Like, yeah. Who, which ones, which service is this one, Stone? Um, Black Rainbow. It's like the, yeah, Black Queer Mental Health. Mm. I think it was set up for um, prevention of uh, suicide prevention in the scheme of things and mental health. And mm -hmm. yeah, um, it, I think it's more of an advocacy body than an actual service. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think that highlights the fact that we don't have easily accessible services for us. That's the one that yeah. always gets referenced in like, what do you, what can we do to like help black queer mob? And that one always gets mentioned, but it's, it is just the suicide prevention and mental health that, but the, it doesn't, that's the only one that gets put out on like Instagram and Facebook when people are like, how can I help black queer mob? Black Rainbow is the only one that's kind of referenced, and um, it's a it's, yeah, it's a very specific. Yeah, I think it just shows you the lack of services that there are. Actually yeah, exactly, exactly. Aboriginal. Yeah. it's a real shame. Like I was, um, I was luckily, I was lucky enough to be, you know, a baby gay in the day when Out Black was around, um, and you know, Uncle Ronnie or you know, Miss Yakai um, was, you know, a, a big a big feature in our queer community. So I was lucky enough when I was your age, Stone, to have those kind of elders and um, queer elders and queer support networks. I don't know that there are organisations like that in Melbourne anymore, is there, Peter? Yeah, there is. There's like a newly formed Koori Pride Network, which okay. yeah, it sits in... Um, so you can look it up on Facebook, but we are looking, you know, I think Naomi and I are been working with that and we've been trying to gather the community around and publicize it because it's a very new sort of organization so but we want more mob to come and support that you know okay. um, we're trying to get it incorporated and um we might even have a home for it i can't say too much at the um new victorian pride center you know so um but we yeah so look, contact me and I can link you into Alison, who's a project worker there, but it's just only really new in the space. And we're still trying to get the word out that let's all support this. Um, yeah, sort of mob out there as well. So I will send you a link to, yeah, Alison's email and stuff like that to you all. Yeah, so it's new in the space and it's great to see, but it's really fledgling. Um, and we need everyone, the mob, queer mob, to get around and support it as well. So, um, 
I was just moving on a bit. Uh, I guess we were talking about that. How do we promote inclusive spaces? Um, you know, the people watching and they're thinking, well, I mean, I think we've covered some of that stuff in the stories we've already told, but is there anything else you want to add? Or, I mean, at the, at this time, I'm open to have a conversation about anything you might feel people might want to hear or, yeah, in the yarn. Hmm. I think about um, not last year's NAIDOC LGBTQI night. Um, and just the fact that we had elders come to the night um, and be there to support and, and you know, to be there and um, just made all, like, us, yeah, all us baby queers be like, oh, like, they see us, they love us for being queer as well as being mob. Um, and just, yeah, so I guess getting elders and people into these spaces that we respect and love and make us feel welcomed and, I guess, Essentially, that would be the elders of the land that we're on. Yeah, thanks. So I think it's really important. You know, I think, um, yeah, um, we're taught, we, because of COVID, the Koori Pride Network has sort of, yeah, it's been really hard, you know, mm. and we were planning a big community meeting um, just before uh, COVID hit the first time. Um, and we, we're all speaking about wanting elders and we actually want Koori Pride Network is an interim name and we want to talk about the way culture weaves its way through our world and what name we can give to the group that's cultural and so it is a space to watch and I guess it's been hard to link people in but I need to be doing that <laughs> now and mm -hmm. telling people they can contact the Koori Pride Network and it's Koori with an IE um, on Facebook um, and get some information, uh, yeah, and they can contact me at, here at Thorn Harbour Health if people want to be linked in as well, so. But, but those, um, um, those kind of groups are, I think, essential to the health and well-being of next gen, well, not all, basically all um, queer First Nation mob, but also the development of next gen, um, you know, because that was like those kind of formative years as, you know, like baby queers, um, you do need those mentorships. You, we do need interaction with the, with older generations that, yeah, kind of do make it safer and easier for us to find our own feet in that world when we're new. Um, it's interesting, you know, now that um, we've got the BLM movement, which is kind of creating a whole other co cultural revolution on top of us all being in lockdown and, and you know this strange time that there is probably time while things are halted not only and it's two parts one for non-indigenous services to be looking at cultural safety and awareness for their own for their own organizations and staff but on top of that is also you know like there is a thing called the rainbow tick so it's not just for non-indigenous some organisations, but for our black organisations too, to be going out for that rainbow tick and understand oh. what we as LGBTIQ plus people, our First Nations mob, what we need in, in our spaces to, to be able to walk in, like Stone was saying, going, well, for, for you know, my, my sexual health needs, I'm, I'm going to steer away from any Aboriginal health organisation because I feel shame. Now, that's a real pity. I think. Mm. Mm. Creates barriers to people accessing services, much needed services, mm. and also for us to look after our health and be supported by that. Yeah. Mm. I just kind of, uh, the, um, a lot of the work I've been doing here, you know, has been supporting um, a group of ACHOs and um, family violence services and health services um, to think about moving along and getting the rainbow tick. So that is sort of happening, which is really exciting. And, um, but, and I think part of this video will, I mean, I think people will watch it from that group, you know, and have listened to our voices, you know, a lot of the, it's actually a hard tick to get, but, um, yeah. And it's a slow process, but the orgs are 
starting to think about it and I'm really excited by it, you know, so I think it's really important. You know what I've noticed working in, I've worked in health for over 10 years and last few years working in mainstream health and now in mental health, I've identified that there's a lot of um, non-Aboriginal mob that are not feeling safe to actually ask questions. So I guess for our mob to have safe, inclusive and non-judgmental services, um, it's important to provide training and opportunities for others to feel safe to ask the question and to provide a safe environment for learning as well. Because I guess there's, um, there has been previously like an us and them. So I guess it's being able to provide training, um, cultural awareness um, for, in a safe environment. So the other mob can actually learn and work out maybe some of the, where some of the service provision is not culturally safe. It's not inclusive. And they're not going to, um, they're not gonna really be welcoming to other mobs, especially brother, brother boys and sister girls, because it's, they're coming from a, a Western, an old outdated Western um, framework of thinking and service delivery where it needs to be about a human experience. It needs to be about everyone's emotional and social well-being, not just around being a number. And it definitely needs to be on a foundation of compassion, I think, and, and caring. So I think that safe, um, safe environment and inclusive environment needs to work both ways. But um, I guess part of my role is training staff in the health system around cultural, um, culturally inclusive and safe environmental practices for our mob. So um, I feel really privileged to be in that position. And also the fact that non-Aboriginal people are feeling safe to ask me questions because it starts with them feeling safe. So then they can actually provide appropriate care to our mob. Yes. Um, yeah, Naomi and I are sort of in the health world and I'm sometimes in the arts world, but Jacob and Stone are in the arts world as well. Is there any lessons to learn from the arts world or things you want to comment on? Um, like changing systems, I guess, we were talking about, Naomi, is, and um, making things more cultural inclusive. And I think yeah. they're really fundamental steps. The thing that I think, just sorry, Stone, I'm just going to jump in real quick. Okay. Um, just what we're noticing at the moment in particularly with the arts community at a time like this with the BLM movement kind of pushing a whole bunch of stuff along, people are jumping into um, uh, programs and opportunities and all kinds of opening of doors for, for what seems like Band-Aid solutions and solutions to think people had just now realised. And it's like, I think the danger with that is that we, what we, what our responsibility is then as, you know, older queer Aboriginal people, especially us older ones, um, is to remind people of the history of people knocking on these doors and trying to get these safe spaces created. It's not just our generation that's done this. It's there's true. been generations prior and there's going to be generations that, uh, to come. And I think, like, while this momentum is happening, it's kind of like, okay, you mob, this isn't a new thing. This has actually been going on for over 50 years. People have been knocking on your doors. You, ju you mob just real slow. <laughs> this is an exciting time. It's like people are waking up at the moment. Hmm. But there's also a lot to be learned from um, history, like some of the programs have gone before, because a lot of our yeah. stuff doesn't get, you know, and particularly in the arts, you know, only a few of us, act, you know, there's, we don't actually have an arts almanac where we can look through an encyclopedia at a lineage of creative um, First Nations practice. You have to go digging for that. And it's the same, I think, by constantly repeating what that lineage has been, 
then we can start to actually see what progress is. Mm. 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 I, yeah, I think there's a history there, but it's not always the easiest history. To, yeah, mm. Mm. I agree with you, Jacob. And Stone, what anything to add to that? Or thoughts? Um, I guess, like, say, spaces in the art world. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, um, like, I pers I love the club. I love going to the club, but that's not a necessarily a great space for everybody. So, like, a great question is like, when was the last time you saw um, an elderly person and a wheel a person in a wheelchair, and then also like children in like a queer space? It'd be like a drinking, not a drinking thing. So like a festival, like midsummer kind of thing. So how do we make safe spaces for everybody that doesn't involve drinking and that doesn't involve going out? Um, mm. So just like a, a place to have a cuppa and yarn and mm. like, yeah, like, like you were saying, I mean, the social well-being as well is also yeah. just as important as, um, everything else holistically holistic health and looking yeah. at everything and safe spaces in all aspects mm, that environmental setting yeah mm. well that might be a good place to um end today's panel um thanks for sharing some of your uh it's just great having our voices raised up and talking about some of these issues and just having a yarn together it makes me feel really happy and proud so I'll leave on that. What what have you done recently that's made you feel proud? I feel proud that I'm here with all you beautiful people. So does anyone want to answer that first or a last comment before we go? I'm feeling a bit proud that I had the courage to go public with this. <laughs> Great. I'm usually like the complete shy person. Um, so it's I, thanks for the... Um, prior encouragement, Peter. Usually, I'm um, I'm sort of behind the scenes. Um, yeah. Oh, look, I'm going to say oh, I'm, glad I'm, I'm Thank feeling. You. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm feeling really proud um, of you, Naomi, because just knowing you for this last hour, meeting you now, I think you're deadly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you should do this more often. More <laughs> deadly. Mm -hmm. And look, may, maybe that's part of the Curry Pride Network. We look at creating a, a safe um, conversation space and storytelling space, you know, to actually, because when we talk this, we actually feel we become more strengthened by sharing our stories of diversity. Thank you, Jake. That was lovely. Thanks, Stone. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. For you. you want to say anything last words, Stone? Sorry. Do you want to say any last words or? Um, just, just big love to everybody and hope you're doing, doing well and keeping comfy during these times. Mm. I want to thank you all. I think, it, uh, I, think I really love, I learned heaps of stuff and I think it shows that we're a really diverse culture. Um, yeah, and you know, that's really important for people to acknowledge that, you know, that our communities are made up of all our different stories and experiences and um, it's so rich. Uh, I'm lucky enough to, uh, you know, have a little finger in the art world and somewhere on the health world and um, it's, it enriches my life immensely. I um, hope you haven't had, had a great time today um, and we'll just, end it there. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.